So this is a brief lecture series in regards to COVID-19. Uh, this was designed for the internal medicine residents, but obviously can be shared by anybody who is providing care for the COVID patients. This is originally created as a very long lecture uh, that was more than 90 slides, but we've since decided that we should probably cut this down and break it down into three parts. So the three parts that we're essentially gonna break it down to is basic background, with information on how to address the PUI and maybe basic appropriate workup for the PUI patient. The second piece of this lecture is going to be when the PUI goes from being a PUI to actually COVID positive. And then the third and final piece is gonna go on to treatment. Full disclosure in regards to this, this is a disease that is rapidly evolving and the information that we're receiving in regards to it changes from a day-to-day -day basis. So if we're watching it this week, it could very easily be changed next week. And so that's something that I encourage anybody who's listening to is to consistently review information that's coming out about this disease process daily. So to go ahead and get started, let's just start talking about what COVID is. So COVID-19 actually started in Wuhan, China in the late, late of last year, so in 2019 and has since spread worldwide. It is an acronym, it stands for Coronavirus Disease of 2019. It was named SARS-CoV-2 because the virus is a genetic cousin of the coronavirus, which caused the SARS outbreak in 2002, which was, of course, SARS-CoV. Scientists had eventually found that the receptor binding domain portion of SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins had evolved to effectively target a molecular feature on the outside of human cells called ACE2, a receptor that is involved in regulating blood pressure. Severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 has a basic reproductive number estimated to be from 2.2 to 3.3. That information is also rapidly changing because there are indicators that individuals can be super spreaders. So one person who is relatively asymptomatic can actually infect up to 10 people. So the 2.2 to 3.3 number, that's you know somewhat ambiguous, but on average, most individuals or there are not should be about 2.2 to 3.3. In epidemiology, the basic reproduction number of an infection can be thought of as the expected number of cases directly to be generated by one case in a population where all individuals are susceptible to the infection. So this is a little bit of a timeline. This timeline is by no means absolutely comprehensive of every important event that's actually happened in the United States or in the world. But there are some interesting things, like we already talked about December 31st of 2019, China had actually reported its first cluster of cases of pneumonia in people at Wuhan uh, province. In January 11th, China actually announced its first death. January 21st was actually the first case in the United States and it was actually in Washington state. January 23rd, China placed Wuhan into quarantine. January 30th, who declared a global health emergency? February 5th, 2020 is an important date for all of us just because that was when the Diamond Princess got quarantined. And I think that was when we all started having heightened awareness of this pandemic or what was about to be become a pandemic. If you guys remember, Diamond Princess um, ultimately resulted in more than 700 confirmed cases of COVID. February 26th, uh, first U.S. citizen to contract the virus through community spread. If you guys remember back to when this all started, we were really convinced that there was going to be no community spread and every single case was going to be secondary to someone who would travel to a place that was very, very highly infected by COVID. But that rapidly evolved, as you can see, based on this ramp up period. February 29th was actually our first death. And finally, on March 11th, it was finally called an pandemic and was labeled as a pandemic. March 26th, the US surpassed China with all of their new cases. Interestingly enough, if you guys follow John Hopkins' website, website, we can see that we stand about half a million infected. And New York seems to serve as our epicenter with almost 200,000 cases and a little bit over 10,000 deaths. That information is updated daily and changes relatively rapidly. We're hoping to see a reduction in the rate of rise of that peak, but it is still evolving every day. So moving off a little bit of the background, who are we testing and are we doing the same thing or something different with all of our healthcare workers? And I'll tell you the answer is relatively shortly, it's no. And so who are we testing now? This actually comes from the CDC. So the CDC has actually divided things into three priorities. Priority one, you can see is hospitalized patients and symptomatic healthcare workers. 
priority two, patients on long-term care facilities greater than 65 years of age, patients with underlying conditions with symptoms. And when they talk about underlying conditions, it's usually those conditions that everybody gets super worried about. Do they have hypertension? Do they have diabetes? Do they have lung disease? Do they have heart failure? Do they have an immunocompromised status? Um, first responders, again, because first responders are the ones that are coming in first contact. And if we lose our first responders, we're obviously going to lose a major major point in our healthcare infrastructure. And then priority three, critical infrastructure workers with symptoms, individuals who do not meet any of the above categories, healthcare workers and first responders, individuals with mild symptoms and communities experience high COVID-19 hospitalizations. Um, this guidance is really what the CDC put out, but I will be completely forthcoming with you. Every state is actually doing something different, and it's usually based on executive orders that are placed by the governor. We in Oklahoma have been primarily doing something similar to what the CDC is recommending. And so the big question everybody asks is why do we place so much emphasis on symptomatic healthcare workers? Well, because we know as we're seeing what's happening in Italy, what's happening in Spain, what happened in China, what's definitely happening in New York, is we need to have our healthcare workers back in the healthcare uh, workforce and we can't afford to lose them because once we start losing them, it's gonna make our infrastructure extremely obsolete and it's gonna overwhelm all the healthcare symptoms. Uh, systems. And so the next question obviously is what happens if these individuals are positive? What do they do? What happens if they're negative? But before we talk about that, I think we really need to talk about the sensitivity and specificity of the RT-PCR, which is the test that we're utilizing to diagnose individuals. So as you can see from here, sensitivity and specificity, we're saying that our tests are nearly 100% specific and somewhere around 70% sensitive. So what does that mean? This is taking you back a little bit to the statistic piece. 100% specificity means that, hey, when you test positive, we are almost 100% assured that that test is actually a true positive and not a false positive. 70% sensitivity is where everybody really needs to kind of focus on. That means out of 1,000 individuals that test negative for the disease, only 700 of those individuals are truly going to be negative. 300 of those individuals may actually have disease, but are actually testing negative for the disease. And so it, it brings up another interesting point. Um, we believe here and pretty much worldwide, it's actually the asymptomatics that are likely driving the epidemic. And so everybody always asks, well, why are we just not testing everybody? Well, what we do know is the RT-PCR sensitivity is low in early illness. It is even lower in asymptomatics, most likely because the level of viremia is much lower, which means if we start testing that everybody that is asymptomatic, you gotta wonder if that sensitivity goes from 76, 70% 70 and is actually drove down. And so you're gonna be testing people, you're gonna get this false sense of security. And in all honesty, those patients are probably positive and they just haven't developed symptoms yet. So it doesn't really make sense to test the asymptomatic knowing that the sensitivity of the test is 70%. So we kind of talked a little bit about, okay, so what do we do with the COVID positives? What do we do with the PUIs? Um, I'm really gonna focus on the COVID positive patients because there are two strategies that have been dictated from the CDC. There's the testing strategy, and then there's the non-testing strategy. The testing strategy says, okay, you've got a COVID positive patient. When can we really take them out of quarantine? So testing strategy says afebrile for 72 hours, seven days since the symptoms appeared, and two negative COVID tests 24 hours apart. So that's the testing strategy. The non-testing strategy says afebrile for 72 hours and seven days since your symptoms started. So everybody has the million dollar question, well, which one are you choosing? You know, there's not really good guidance from the CDC. There's not really good guidance from the World Health Organization. A lot of people are erring on using the testing strategy for individuals that are going to be very exposed to the community or very exposed to patient care. So that would be healthcare professionals, that would be your nurses, that would be your doctors, or individuals that are taking care of LTAC patients, etc. So that would say if, for instance, one of the physicians got sick, they got diagnosed with COVID positivity, we would say, hey, 72 hours afebrile without taking fever-reducing medications, seven days since your symptoms appeared, you have to have clinical symptomatology improvement, and then we would bring you back in, we would test you, 
24 hours apart to make sure that we got two negative COVID tests to release you back into the workforce. Everybody always asks these questions, why are you doing two? Again, remember what I told you from the most previous slide, those individuals are, those individuals are potentially having a 70% sensitivity, so you don't want to actually get a false negative test. And so you want to make sure that you increase the sensitivity by doing two tests. Uh, that are negative so you can feel assured that that test was actually representative of them having cleared the disease. So what happens with the individuals that you are testing that you're like, oh man, these individuals are really, really high suspect for having COVID. Maybe they were exposed to a COVID positive patient, maybe they're having all the classic symptoms, but they come back negative in their healthcare worker. Do you really expose those individuals to everybody that they're going to see and potentially spread the disease? If you really have high suspicion and you get a negative test, it is very reasonable for you to repeat the test. If they come back negative again, but man, your suspicion is still high, but you need to get them back into the work, uh, work, workforce, one of the suggestions is, okay, you've got your negative test. Um, they're clinically improving. You can very easily put a mask on the patient and make sure anytime we're exposing individuals that they're wearing the mask so their transmissibility actually goes down quite a bit. So this brings up another really interesting question that all, everyone always asks. There's a difference between exposure and symptomatic. So what the CDC has done is they've tried to break down what is considered high risk exposure, medium risk exposure, and low risk exposure. I'll be completely honest with you. What we do with high risk exposures and medium risk exposures are the same and different for the low risk exposures. So I kind of clump high risk and medium risk into one category when we talk about what we do with them. But to talk about the definitions first, so high risk exposure is an individual who had prolonged close contact with a patient that was COVID positive, neither they, the healthcare provider, or the patient was wearing a face mask. So that's high risk. A medium risk exposure is, hey, the patient was not, uh, was wearing a face mask, but the healthcare provider was not. Again, medium risk, patient was wearing a face mask, healthcare provider was not. Low risk exposure is when both the patient and the healthcare provider are wearing a mask. And I mean, that makes sense. Reducing transmissibility between those two individuals goes down quite a bit when both individuals are actually wearing a mask. So what do we do when we know, because let's just be honest, if you're in the healthcare field, you are going to have exposures. It's just something that we have to accept. So initially, what CDC was recommending was anybody who had a high risk or medium risk exposure should go into self-quarantine for 14 days. Symptomatic, not symptomatic, they should go into self-quarantine for 14 days. Individuals who were at low risk were allowed to return to work, but they should be self-monitoring themselves for symptoms, so temperature, shortness of breath, and cough every 12 hours, and they were supposed to notify supervisors of any symptoms. You can imagine, again, if you're working in a hospital setting or a clinic setting, there's going to be a very good chance that you're having a medium to high risk exposure pretty continuously for a lot of different reasons. And so the CDC has added some additional guidance. If you have had an exposure, but we still need to get you back into the healthcare workforce and you are 100% asymptomatic, you are allowed to return to the healthcare workforce as long as you are self-monitoring every 12 hours, again, for the classic symptoms, fever greater than 100.4 degrees, shortness of breath or cough, and you should be wearing a mask until your 14 days is up to make sure that you are not going to, I guess you could say, convert to a positive. Because remember, just because you're exposed doesn't 100% mean that you're going to be infected by the disease. And why is that? If you walk in a room or if you walk by a room with a COVID positive patient, the likelihood of you actually contracting that is pretty darn low. And so usually what the CDC says, if you're within six feet for greater than 10 minutes and nobody is wearing a mask, that is really when you increase your risk of exposure. And so it's really hard to remember, you know, when someone asks you, hey, I think I was exposed. Well, how were you exposed? It's really hard to remember exactly what you were doing, how long you were there, whether you were within six feet or not. So the guidance is very conservative, but really it is there for best practice. So one of the questions that 
we always get is, well, what other type of testing is out there? You know, we're hearing a lot about other tests, about uh, antibody testing, about rapid testing, et cetera. So what can I tell you about that? Well, first of all, Celex and the Mayo Clinic launched their first test to determine COVID-19 immunity from previous exposure. This was actually published April 3rd, 2020. Uh, the US FDA approved it at that point in time, and it was the first test that was approved to look for antibodies against the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Um, this looks for, instead of looking for the RT-PCR that looks for actually like genetic material, this looks at IgG and IgM. So it can actually tell you about exposure and active disease. It's very new and upcoming. Many labs are really trying to race to the finish line to get similar type of testing approved. But bottom line right now, this is the only one that's readily available that is actually FDA approved for testing for, immune, uh, for antibodies. So I caution everybody out there only because we're having all of these pop-up labs and pop-up areas that are saying that their test is they're not using the word FDA approved, but they're saying you know, expedited approval, et cetera. You have to be sure when you're using this type of testing that it's actually valid or so you're giving information to individuals that may not actually be correct. I suspect as the time goes on, you're gonna see more and more of these tests come live and more of these tests become readily available and actually receive some type of validation that we can actually start using these more widely in the community. But right now, and again, this is gonna change day to day, week to week, right now, Celex is the only one that actually has approval um, to be utilized in this, in this form. And so what about this 15 minute test by Abbott? Everybody wants to talk about the 15 minute test by Abbott. The public health officials, um, all the way up the change called it a game changer. Uh, Abbott, Labor, Abbott Laboratory said that they could promise test results with as little as five minutes. Um, they indicated when they first went out this that they could test almost 300,000 to 500,000 people. Um, what we found out very quickly when a document circulated at the Department of Health and Human Services and the Federal Emergency Management Agency that that state was only able to test about 5,500 coronavirus tests. Um, so you can imagine 5,500 is very different than 500,000. Um, and so that has become very limited accessibility. And to be completely honest with you, it's being delivered to those states or those regions that have the highest need. So you can, manage, you can imagine here in Oklahoma, we have a very different need than the need perhaps in New York where they really need to get these tests turned around. So my understanding, and again, this may change day to day, is that type of device has been allocated to specific regions. And even if Oklahoma has received some of them, the amount that they've actually received is very, very limited. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Uh, I gave you guys a little bit of background about what's going on and kind of about how the timeline was and what COVID really was. Well, let's talk about some of the really important things when you're actually interacting with these patients. Um, one thing that I will remind everybody is it, you really should approach every single patient at this point in time before you actually interview them and get information from them to, to consider them COVID positive until you can actually do appropriate screening um, and appropriate history and physical to either assure you that they're either COVID positive or they're not uh, COVID positive. So to start, we're gonna talk a little bit about the incubation period. And so the incubation period, of course, as you guys know, if we go back in time a little bit about what incubation period means, it means that you've been exposed and how long does it take you to actually develop symptoms. I think this is important to know for a couple of reasons, which I'll kind of emphasize. Most people say the incubation period is somewhere between two to 14 days. If you look at all the research that's been created or been developed through Wuhan, through Italy, through New York, through Washington, average is about 5.1 days until individuals truly develop symptoms. There was a really good quote by Dr. Fauci. It, it said, in all the history of respiratory borne viruses of any type, asymptomatic transmission has never been the driver of outbreaks. That was a quote that was taken from him on uh, January 28th, and we kind of know that. We always talk about individuals who have flu. Well, they don't usually transmit flu until they actually become symptomatic, and then when they don't become symptomatic, they can be released back into the work, um, workforce. This virus doesn't play by the rules that we have seen most viruses play by. And so this was a pretty profound statement by Dr. Fauci, which I think that we need to take into consideration. 
most individuals will actually experience symptoms by day 12, and the number that they quote is 97% of individuals will develop symptoms at day 12. And so it kind of makes sense why they decided that 14 days was going to be the day for quarantine then. Because if you develop symptoms by day 12, then if you get to day 14, you're in the clear, right? Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. In a study of 1,099 patients with confirmed symptomatic COVID, um, the mean incubation period was four days. Most patients develop symptoms by day 12, like we've already said, but then you get this report that's put out by the Annals of Internal Medicine that suggests, sure, okay, everybody, 97%, what about the other 3%? They suggest that out of 101 out of every 10,000 cases will develop symptoms after 14 days. And that's 14 days of active monitoring or quarantine. Um, makes you kind of question, is this an acceptable number? Well, it's really hard to say what's acceptable and what's not, because we'll talk about a little bit later in the lecture, you know, some individuals can actually shed virus up to 37 days. And so if we, it, you, you can imagine how hard it would be to quarantine individuals up to 37 days, everybody, you know, put them all in the same playing field. And so 14 days right now is pretty much the most acceptable number that we have. But just because I say quarantine for 14 days does not mean that there's a 0% chance that you will develop symptoms past day 14. From data collected by the Diamond Princess, which we already talked about in the timeline, 18% of infected cases remained asymptomatic. Um, but there is some data elsewhere that says many, as many as 85% of individuals um, remain asymptomatic. Again, a little bit of a different number. Uh, the CDC has said that someone can transmit the virus up to 48 hours before symptoms develop. And remember, that goes back to Dr. Fauci. Never in the history of viruses has have asymptomatics been the ones that are driving disease, but the CDC even supports this by saying that 48 hours before symptoms develop, you can actually be transmitting virus. It becomes a very, very tricky and tenuous time for all of us. So the PUI, let's just say that you have a patient that is coming through the emergency room. One of the biggest things that everybody always asks about, well, what symptoms should I ask about to really determine whether they have risk or they don't have risk? So you can see I've listed here fever, about 88% of individuals will experience fever somewhere on the continuum of their infection, but does not mean that they experience it right off the get-go. In fact, some people will say only 50% of individuals are febrile on presentation. Again, most people will develop fear, fever during their continuum, but it does not necessarily mean that fever is 100% the hallmark. Uh, shortness of breath, 81 to, 18 to 31%, cough about 66%. Um, anosmia is definitely something that has gained a lot of attention in the media and attention as far as clinically because people were saying that it was pathognomonic. I'm not going to say that it's pathognomonic. There are other viruses that actually present with anosmia, but it is something that you should ask about in your history. They're reporting about 30% of individuals will experience anosmia as perhaps their presenting symptom or develop it during their infection. Uh, myalgias and diarrhea. Diarrhea I put down there because this number is a ever-moving target. Um, most of the literature is consistent that 10 to 20 percent will develop diarrhea. It will not be the hallmark of their disease, but they may develop diarrhea. Uh, there is some literature that was published by the American College of Gastroenterology that said that 50 percent of individuals have diarrhea. That was a very small study of about 204 patients, so I would not hang your hat on diarrhea as being one of the presenting signs of COVID. 13.9% uh, of patients will have sore throat, 13.6% of patients will have headache. The one thing that I do also want to pull out here, just because it's a topic that we'll talk about in the next several lectures, is something called silent hypoxemia. You will hear me refer to it as either silent hypoxemia or the happy hypoxic. These individuals will develop uh, hypoxemia and respiratory failure without dyspnea. So you will see photos of individuals that are all over different types of social media, Twitter, Instagram, etc., of O2 saturations of 60 to 70% and the patient is absolutely unfazed. 
So just remember that is something that you should be paying attention to. So those patients may come in, they may be complaining of shortness of breath, you may put a pulse ox on their finger, you'll see that it's like 60%, you'll completely disregard it, but understand that is something that we're actually seeing with this disease that seems to be pretty consistent in large populations. The other thing that I want you guys to remember too is that this disease actually has a biphasic presentation. The first phase of this infection is the usual suspect. So everything that I've listed on this slide, that usually occurs during the first week after onset of symptoms. And then there becomes the second stage. And that usually happens between somewhere between five and 10 days where you can actually see rapid clinical deterioration. Um, and the second phase is really where we start seeing these individuals jump into respiratory distress and potential signs of septic shock. And so just remember that this disease can have this biphasic period. So you can see a patient in the clinic and they're doing great. You send them home, they're doing uh, fantastic. And then all of a sudden they're ending them back in the hospital. And it's because they're hitting that second phase of the disease process where they start clinically deteriorating. So Interview process, again, we talk about the classic triad of symptoms that we always talk about, the fever, shortness of breath, um, or cough. What I am gonna tell you is if at all possible, if you can interview these individuals over the phone, you can do a virtual visit or any type of alternate method, that's probably the best recommendation that we can give you. Um, it reduces your exposure, reduces their exposure. Uh, it's overall a good practice in this time. If it is not possible to interview them over the phone or virtually or for whatever reason we can't do this, um, make sure that you're donned. So remember I told you to approach each patient like they are potentially COVID positive. And so when I say donned, it means we're the appropriate PPE when you're doing your interview. And so the surgical ear loop mask uh, with a face shield, gown and gloves in a room where there's no concern for aerosolide procedure is appropriate. Um, if the individual is going under any type of aerosolized procedure, and so when we say aerosolized procedure, are they receiving a handheld nebulizer? Do you think that you're gonna to have to intubate the patient? Um, are they receiving some type of CPT or something that's going to definitely aerosolize uh, the droplets? Are they on BiPAP? Are they in high flow? Those are things that you need to be aware of when you're walking to the room, because if you are walking into the room to interview a PUI and they're receiving one of those aerosolized procedures, you should make sure that you've got an N95, a face shield and gown and gloves, because that will reduce your risk of contracting virus. Uh, for the majority of the interview, if you're actually in the room, make the best effort to stay six feet apart from the patient and try to limit the amount of time that you're in the room to less than 10 minutes. So kind of as I already mentioned earlier in this lecture, what they found is if it's less than six feet, um, or sorry, if you're greater than six feet and you can keep your time to less than 10 minutes, that'll also reduce the healthcare provider's exposure. So why do I say that it's okay to do your interviews via telehealth or virtual medicine? Because that's definitely not something that we have um, supported hugely in the past, uh, but it is something that we are supporting now. And honestly, CMS is actually supporting this as well. CMS has relaxed many of the requirements to allow for more flexible evaluation and management of these patients. Um, and you guys have probably already seen that we're doing a lot of our visits either through telehealth or virtual health. We're using phones to interview patients and check up on patients multiple times a day. And CMS has really supported us because they recognize that increasing exposure does two things that we don't wanna do. Number one, it exposes the providers. Number two, it really burns through PPE, which we'll talk about here in the next second. And we wanna to try to be as conservative with the PPE as possible while still providing good patient care. So you can just see here, and I'm not gonna read this to you, you know, verbatim, but emergency department visits, uh, Initial uh, observation and observation discharge can easily be billed as far as telehealth is concerned. Day-to-day um, -day management does not require necessarily the provider to physically examine the patient every single day, um, but making sure that we're interacting with the patient on some level is still very valuable and very important because like I told you, this disease has a tendency to turn on the dime, everyone's doing okay, and then all of a sudden they start decompensating. So important for us to still be interacting with these patients.
So other questions that I wanna make sure that you guys ask is questions relating to the medical history. Uh, so specifically what we all talk about or what's been talked about in the literature is heart disease, including hypertension, lung disease, diabetes, and immunocompromised status and a cancer history. And I'll show a slide next as to why this is uh, that important. Other things that you wanna make sure that you collect when you're doing their interview is what their household is like. Do they live in a nursing home? Are they at an LTAC? Are they at a skilled nursing facility? Do they have home health? Are they a dialysis patient? Because again, remember this really increases the amount of exposures that they have had and what they will also expose other individuals to. Um, you also wanna know who comes in and out of the house and who lives there. Do they live in a one bedroom house with a shared bathroom with five people? Because again, if you're talking about the PUI and you're talking about getting them back home to self quarantine, if they have one bedroom and one bathroom and five people in there, that obviously becomes very difficult. So we try to collect all this information up up top. Occupation, are they a healthcare worker? Are they around multiple people? Again, because when you're releasing them back into the community, you need to know what you're releasing them to and what you are doing to that community that they're going to be exposing themselves to. Um, and age is really important. Again, I'll show you on the next slide as to why that is as important as it is. This is information collected from Wuhan. Um, I will tell you that we are seeing these same statistics in Italy, we're seeing these same statistics in New York and Washington. They might not be the exact same, but really more or less, the general theme is very, very similar. So you can see the older you get, uh, greater than 80 years of age, your fat uh, case fatality risk goes up to about 14.8%. You can see if you have cardiovascular disease, your fatality uh, risk goes up to about 10.5%. So these things have a tendency to also be cumulative. When you have more than one comorbidity, your risk goes up um, quite a bit. And so the older you are and the more comor comorbidities you have really puts you at high risk from having complications from COVID-19. This probably isn't too unfamiliar, we know the older we get and the more disease process we have, any type of illness can actually affect us quite a bit. This one seems to be a little exaggerated. Um, so something that we very much need to collect on when we are interviewing the PUI. So age, very, very important, and comorbidities is extremely important as well. So this data, this definitely is dated. This was actually from March 31st. I collected this, um, actually through the help of some of our administrative staff at OSU CHS, just to see where Oklahoma is in the mix of things. You can see we've got a population of about 4 million and you can see our death rate is about 3.53%. So when you start looking at the death rate across all of the world, they will say that the death rate is somewhere between 0.5 and 7.2%. I can tell you Oklahoma has not been doing super and the reason we think that Oklahoma is not doing well is because of the high rate of comorbidities that we have in the population as is. So tobacco abuse, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease. When we see these patients, particularly patients that are older than 60 to 65, most of the time they at least have two, two, three of these comorbidities. And I really suspect that is what's driving our case fatality rate in Oklahoma in comparison to the rest of the nation. So what labs do you order? So now you've got the PI, you've done your history, you've done your physical, what are you supposed to order? There are several labs that have been reported to be pretty helpful as far as initial admission and as far as tracking these patients for suspected comorbidities, et cetera, or for suspected prognosis. Um, some of the labs that we always talk about is CBC with automated differential for lymphopenia because we are definitely seeing a higher level of lymphopenia in individuals that are affected by COVID. We look at their CMP because we definitely want to look at their transaminitis. We look at a CPK uh, to see if they have evidence of developing rhabdo, a procalcitonin, a CRP, LDH, ferritin. A lot of times when these patients come in with fever, we are still looking at other things that can be causing fever like UA and blood cultures. We're also looking at a fiber engine. There are some labs that are looking at IL-6 too, which I did not include here because currently we're not testing it at OSU, but if you have lab availability to test for that, that is something that individuals are recommending because of the 
second phase of this illness, that biphasic peak, which we really think is mediated by what we call a cytokine storm. IL-6 is a cytokine, so if you have availability and access to ordering an IL-6, and those patients enter that biphasic period where they go to cytokine storm, that could be a good hallmark in regards to this. Um, to diagnose SARS-CoV, what we're doing is an RT-PCR. We are recommending that it is collected by a nasopharyngeal swab. There is a lot of talk about, well, is the nasopharyngeal swab better than the oropharyngeal swab or the equivalent? I will tell you that there was one study which is pretty limited as far as their amount of people that they looked at, but they did say that the nasopharyngeal swab was a little bit more sensitive and specific. The two studies were super not valid, but really right now what is being recommended is doing the RT-PCR on a nasopharyngeal swab um, at, over the oropharyngeal swab. Chest x-ray, super important on presentation. You know, we talk about the bi basilar ground glass opacities that you can see uh, that are highly suggestive of developing a viral type pneumonia. Initially, there was a lot of hype about doing CT scans on all these individuals. What I will tell you right now, CT, CT is not a diagnostic tool for COVID. You guys know as well as I do, there are a lot of different things that can present with ground glass opacities. So just ordering a CT to see ground glass opacities does not mean that you have a definitive diagnosis of COVID. You can see ground glass opacities with other disease type processes, including mycoplasma, chlamydia. Sometimes it gives the appearance of pulmonary edema, so not diagnostic for COVID-19. The other thing that I wanted to kind of talk about to you um, in regards to the nasopharyngeal swab, we already talked about, hey, if you get a nasopharyngeal swab and it's negative, but you have high suspicion, always okay to repeat it, particularly if that patient is clinically deteriorating because we know the sensitivity of this test is only 70%. So what about everything else that we're used to testing? What about all of these echoes that we're testing? What about all of those things? Well, we have to change our mindset a little bit. We want to really avoid unnecessary testing unless you're pretty sure that it's going to change your clinical management. So if it's not going to change your clinical management in the first 24 to 36 hours of the patient being there, if you can hold off on ordering these tests to limit, again, two things, healthcare worker exposure and conserve PPE, it's probably recommended to do so. If those tests aren't gonna change what you do in that instant, I would wait till at least you have a negative test or maybe even a positive test so that people can be appropriately donned and appropriately aware when they're entering that room what the status of that patient is. The other thing that I put in here, um, which, <laughs> we should be doing on every single patient. I don't think that we're super about doing this and I think that we need to get better, particularly in this time, is we need to have the hard conversations up front with the PUI, particularly if the PUI is not doing well. So if you have a PUI, let's give an example, an 87 year old uh, patient that is uh, in a nursing home, has advanced dementia, and, and nobody's had that advanced directive discussion with them, now is definitely the time to have it, particularly if that's patient coming in, they don't look well clinically, they're hypoxic. We showed a slide that shows that individuals that are elderly and that have multiple comorbidities don't necessarily do well, and they've got a pretty high fatality rate. What we also know is individuals that end up requiring ventilator therapy, it is really a dismal statistic on how successful we are on getting those patients off the ventilator. We know that you have less than 50% chance of coming off the ventilator if you end up on the ventilator with COVID. That number is very much driven by this population that has multiple comorbidities at advanced age. So it is very important for us to have these discussions with these individuals up front um, before they get sick and then we're having these discussions about, well, what do we do now? So I put this in for a couple different reasons, just because number one, it's a huge, it's a huge topic. And you can see that multiple hospitals have gone to making decisions about universal DNR policies. Uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago was discussing a do not resuscitate policy for all infected patients, regardless of the wishes of the patient or their family. Officials at George Washington University said they've had similar conversations. Um, and, and, and so what, what do we do about this? Well, I can tell you there was an article published by the Patient Safety and Quality Healthcare Group that 
said that hospitals that want to consider a universal policy of not resuscitating COVID-19 patients with heart or breathing failure should take steps to avoid violating patients' rights under Medicare conditions of participation. Um, and this was actually quoted from two executives from the Joint Commission. And so what does that mean for us? It means that it is a very, very risky thing to do to instate a universal do not resuscitate policy. That's why I had that last bullet in on the other slide that says have the hard conversations up front with the PUI or their designated healthcare proxy. Because what we don't want to do is find ourselves in this position. I don't really, in my personal opinion, I don't support just making a blanket universal do not resuscitate policy for the hospital when someone is determined to be COVID positive. I think it's risky. I think if you looked at what happened in Hurricane Katrina, after the acute incident wears off, there is a lot of speculation and a lot of hindsight that goes into decisions that were made that felt right at the time. But a lot of things feel right in the time when it's being uh, done by adrenaline. So I think what we need to remember is just basic principles. We need to remember autonomy. We need to remember that having difficult discussions up front is probably the better way to go. The same thing applies for um, ventilator allocation and medication allocation. I think we need to be very careful about making blanket policies, and I think we need to be more upfront with our patients and what we expect their outcomes to be. I think when you have those conversations that are very realistic up front, people's expectations are actually not far off from what our expectations are. So I get it, hard to have these conversations, particularly in this time, but very, very important for us to do. So moving a little bit away from that, so now we've interviewed the PUI, we have ordered our labs, what do we do about isolation? And so what we're recommending right now is enhanced droplet slash contact precautions. Um, which is a little bit different from what these studies originally said right off the get-go. It said that every single patient should be in a negative pressure room and every single patient should take airborne precautions. And so this, is, this gets confusing and this is something that we keep revisiting because the risk of aerosolization is a constant topic of discussion about whether this virus truly does aerosolize or whether it's really transmitted by droplet. I'm going to be completely forthcoming with you. I don't know what the answer is going to be at the end of the day. I don't know if there is gonna be some level of aerosolization. I can tell you with procedures that increase the aerosolization um, capacity, yes, 100%, those individuals should have their healthcare providers and N95s, et cetera. But what about the patients that aren't? What about the patients that are just being observed for 24 to 48 hours? Is it really important for every single patient to wear, an, uh, every single provider to wear an N95? I'm not sure. And so we know both COVID-19 and the SARS virus have an aerosolized, aerosolized maybe of 1.1 hours, meaning that half the particles drop out of the air after that amount of time and half of what remains drop out in another 1.1 hours. After a day, roughly nine half-lives, 0 0.002 of the original particles remain. Because of this, Scientists said 100% aerosol transmission is plausible since the virus can remain viable and infectious in aerosols for hours. The hours that they label that with is about three to three and a half hours. What's interesting, scientists that were not involved in the study raised a couple of concerns. Number one, does the mechanical nebulizer that they used during this study really stimulate cough or sneezes? And whether something in the laboratory can really reflect what's happening in the real world. And so there's some criticisms of the article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that said that there was definitely aerosolized up to three hours. And again, we know this because we go through journal clubs and we can come up with a lot of critiques. It doesn't really apply to what we're seeing in the real world. I'm not sure. The other flip flip side of this is, you know, most people think that SARS-CoV is transmitted primarily by droplets. They think that personal protective equipment, including surgical masks, disposable gowns, gloves, and protective eyewear should suffice. In addition, it allows us to conserve N95 masks and controlled uh, powered air purifying respiratories or PAPRs for patients with diseases like tuberculosis. However, that being said, full airborne isolation precautions should continue at high-risk procedures, including intubation, bronchoscopy, um, high flow nasal cannula, BiPAP, et cetera. In addition, individuals should truly be accommodated in a 
single room um, just to make sure that we're not cross-contaminating, et cetera, particularly if we've got a PUI who ends up becoming negative in a room with a PUI that ends up becoming positive. That's certainly not what we want to do. But the likelihood of a hospital having all negative pressure rooms um, it, it is really not probably realistic. And so, yes, really for these patients, we should be doing enhanced droplet and contact precautions. This should suffice for most patients unless they're having aerosolized procedures. Aerosolized procedures, individuals should have airborne precautions and ideally should be in a room that is a negative pressure room. Because we don't have those, for those patients that are gonna receive air, um, aerosolized procedures, we need to make sure that the providers that are entering that room actually have an N95 mask on. So I thought that this was actually a pretty good breakdown. It actually came from Kaiser Permanente. Um, that gives us a list of what we should be doing. Like you can see right off the get-go, the precautions, droplet precautions for most, um, airborne precautions for those high-risk procedures. We need to put patients, particularly PUIs, all single rooms, uh, negative pressure rooms are really reserved for those uh, procedures that are really going to increase the risk of aerosolization. Uh, po population management, um, this can be kind of geographic isolation, if you will. Um, personnel should be wearing the appropriate uh, PPE when they're going into rooms. Um, and, and I'm not gonna read this to you because it's a, it's a great slide, but I'm not gonna read line for line exactly what everything says. So what about the PPE shortage? I've kind of alluded to this in the beginning about us, how do we conserve PPE? It, it's, it's a difficult time, you know, because this is something that we're not used to thinking of. You know, we, we're used to having one, maybe two TB patients um, in the hospital where we can use as much PPE as we want. That's not where we are now. I mean, we can tell this just based on the fact that we've shut down all elective surgeries so that we can conserve our PPE. So what about reusing our PPE? So right now we're saying we're trying not to do this for gloves and gowns. I'm not sure that that's not gonna happen soon, um, but right now we're still doing okay with gloves and gowns. But face shields and then 95 mask. These, there's a difference between extended wear and reuse. So extended wear means you are using your N95 for the entire day. If you plan on using your N95 for more than one day, that is what we talk about for reuse. So let's talk about extended wear first. So when we're going into a room with a PUI or a COVID positive patient, essentially we go in, we don appropriately. When we come out and we doff, we're moving our gown and gloves, we're closing the door, um, we are reapplying gowns and gloves as we go from room to room. At the very end of seeing our patients, what we will end up doing is we will take off our face shield. We'll make sure that our face shield is appropriately cleaned. And so I kind of list out the steps here and there's some videos that are available on Ozone. We clean our mask and then we, or we clean our, our face shield and then we store it. And then we also take off our N95 and we store it for the day. Um, so that we can reuse it on that same day. We have actually gone to reusing uh, N95s um, up to three times because we've developed a steroid utilization uh, technique which allows us to use our masks up to three times. That being said, if there's any physical defect, if there's any contamination, or you cannot create a seal with the N95, we absolutely should not be reusing it. And again, I'm not gonna go through this 100% step-by-step. This information is there for you to review. In addition, this information is also available in the COVID-19 handbook. Um, and there are links that you can watch on YouTube on how to do this. And it's also available on Ozone. So what do we think about reusing PPE? Again, not super, super happy that we're actually in this position because it's not the ideal situation, but it's where we are and it's what we have to deal with. So there was a study and it was uh, reported in the Infection Control Hospital and Epidemiology on March 26th. Um, what the study did was it looked at 90 samples collected from 30 healthcare workers, including doctors, nurse, cleaners, leaving the room of 15 patients. According to the study results, the median time spent in the room was about six minutes, so again, that less than 10 minutes. Activities performed range from casual contact and cleaning to closer contact like physical examination and collection of respiratory samples. Results showed that all 90 of the samples obtained from healthcare workers tested negative for SARS-CoV. Okay, so 
what's really interesting is the authors did know, although the study <laughs> made us feel a lot better, dig into the study, what you'll find is the study had several limitations. They were surface swabs for sampling the N95 mask rather than processing masks and extraction buffers with detergents, a method that we use for isolation of influenza from N95 respirators. In addition, they were being treated in airborne infection isolation rooms with 12 air exchanges per hour, which means that the results are not generalizable to the other types of rooms. So like I've already mentioned, we don't have negative pressure rooms in every room in the hospital. So you've got to question the generalizability of this study to what we actually face day to day. The authors did not evaluate the concomitant level of viral contamination in the environment uh, to correlate with the degree of PPE contamination. There was a previous laboratory study that demonstrated that viruses such as SARS-CoV and human coronavirus 229E does remain viable on PPE items, including latex gloves, disposable gowns, but that study was not performed in clinical setting. So we're not sure what is going to be viable on the PPE or not, which is very much why you see us using face shields over our uh, N95s or whatever the case may be when actually interacting with a COVID positive patient or COVID PVI, because we're trying to minimize the risk as much as possible. The other thing that I can say about this too is just make sure that you're not touching your face when you are uh, in your PPE. So just imagine I walk out of a patient's room, I still have my gloves on for whatever reason, and I touch my mask, and then I take my gloves off. Well, my mask is infected, and then I touch the mask. Like You, you just have to be very careful and mindful of not trying to cross-contaminate yourself. So we know that there's a shortage, um, but does that mean that we shouldn't take the efforts to protect ourselves? This data is continuously changing. I'm sure you guys remember when this first started is nobody needs to wear a mask. And then, oh, maybe healthcare providers need to wear a mask. Then no, patients need to be wearing a mask. Okay, now the entire public is wearing a mask. It, it is also a moving target. It changes from day to day. Um, so we can't, we can't predict what tomorrow is gonna bring. Um, I will tell you that most hospitals, including our own, has gone to universal masking of our healthcare providers, and I think that's the right decision for now. Do we run the risk of running out of PPE when we hit our surge? Yes, it's possible, but we can't take the risk of putting our healthcare providers in direct line of fire now and afford losing them in the future. So it's something that we are trying to be mindful of, conservative with, um, but not something that we can just eliminate. There was an interesting article in New England Journal of Medicine that says that universal masking alone is not a panacea. Uh, masks will not protect providers caring for a patient if it's not accompanied by meticulous hand hygiene, eye protection, and a gown. So that is where I go back to good hand hygiene. It is so, so important. We've known this from previous studies um, that have been an over and over and over again. What we do know is healthcare workers are the worst about doing good hand hygiene. When you're doing good hand hygiene, you should be washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 minutes to ensure that you are adequately reducing your risk of transmitting virus. So yes, wear the mask, but also don't forget the other things that are equally as important. So you have your PY, you've had your advanced directive discussion, you've kind of figured out what their risk is as far as whether you consider their high risk or their low risk. Um, what happens, because we already said that the PUI might actually go into the biphasic period and they actually make it worse. So what are the things that you need to look at to determine if your PUI needs to be moved to higher QV4? So for us right now, it's the patient that's in the COVID step down going to the COVID ICU. These patients do have a tendency to acutely to compensate. Usually if that's going to happen, it happens within 24 to 48 hours. So we have to be vigilant for decompensation. Probably the first thing that you are going to see is the patient's oxygen needs are actually starting to increase. And so when we look at this, we kind of talk about a couple of things. Well, okay, is the PUI getting better? Well, if the PUI is getting better, can we talk about discharging the PUI? And if they're discharging, can they sell quarantine? Do they have support? All those types of things that'll make them successful at home. And then the flip side of that is no, if they're getting worse, they might have to go to the COVID ICU. A lot of that is dictated by how much oxygen they're requiring. A lot of the literature came out and said that 
if they're requiring greater than six liters, they immediately need to be intubated. That literature is dated, and that is definitely not what we're doing here because we found that patients that go on the ventilator don't do as well. If they are requiring greater than six liters, the question really needs to be, though, is should they be monitored a little bit closely for proning, et cetera, high flow in the ICU? This is very much clinical judgment, but one of the things that you 100% need to be most cautious of is when these patients start requiring more O2 are they hitting that tipping point where they will just compensate in the next 24 to 48 hours? So oxygenation ability and really how does the patient look? Do they look distressed? Do they look like they're struggling? Are they demonstrating accessory muscle usage? Are their hemodynamics changing to the point where we think that they are going to go into septic shock? Those are the things that really tell you, hey, this patient might need to be moved to a different floor. So some labs, of course, that might help you determine if those individuals are also decompensating. Um, we already talked about checking the CBC on presentation. Uh, CRP, low CRP levels, uh, 1 to 20, usually makes us feel pretty comfortable. Anybody who's going to 48 to 98 might be a sign of decompensation. A procalcitonin is usually pretty... Um, pretty much negative in early COVID, but can be elevated as this disease progresses. An elevated uh, procalcitonin of greater than 0.5 in a definitive COVID patient is a hallmark of poor, poor outcomes. Uh, ferritin and LDH, a ferritin of greater than 300, LDH of greater than 245 has been linked with poor prognoses. Uh, transaminases are elevated in 30% of patients. Usually these transaminases don't go much above 200, but they are elevated. Um, you know, and we have this thing about PCR of other respiratory viruses. Uh, I kept this in. We're not really checking PCR of other respiratory viruses, but we have found that somewhere between 5 to 20 percent of individuals may also be co-infected with other disease processes, such as influenza. So again, can I send my PUI home? And so you've got this patient, they're on a PUI observation floor, or for us, it's in the PUI step down. Um, you may get a test back, you may not get a test back. So what do we do about those patients if for some reason we're waiting 48 hours but the patient looks pretty well? You know, can you send them home? Yeah, 100% you can send them home. According to the WHO guidelines, um, individuals who really have symptoms of mild illness should be monitored at home. Um, as long as they have a good support system and they have the capacity to get to hospital if they should, in fact, clinically deteriorate. Um, isolation is 100% necessary uh, for these individuals, particularly while they're waiting for their status. And so you have to make sure that that is actually going to be feasible for them. Uh, so why are we admitting some of these PYs? I guess is oftentimes a question that I get. We know, you guys have seen the slide, that older patients, particularly with those with comorbidities, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, they have an increased risk of severe disease and mortality. So it is not unreasonable to bring these patients into the hospital and observe them for 24 hours. Like I had mentioned previously, usually when decompensation transpires, it transpires in the first 24 to 48 hours. So watching these patients in observation status is not necessarily the wrong thing, but keeping them in the hospital just awaiting a negative serology is also not the right thing, particularly if they're a negative COVID patient. You don't want to continue to increase their exposure risk, and you also don't want to burn through the PPE. If they've got a suitable situation to be discharged to, it is absolutely reasonable for you to consider discharging those patients. So now you're discharging your patient, they're a PY or they're COVID positive, what do you tell them? Um, you want to be able to, for both of them, you want to be able to maintain social distancing. Um, again, social distancing, can they self-quarantine within the home? Do they have a separate bathroom? Do they have a separate bathroom? Do they have separate kitchen utensils? Um, you also want to tell them, like, you don't want pets going from room to room because we're not 100% convinced that pets can't transmit virus while you're petting dog and then your significant other is petting the same dog. And you want to make sure that they have the ability to clean high touch surfaces. We've already talked a little bit about this is if they're COVID positive, um, you need to make sure that they are in a facility that they can self quarantine and then you give them two strategies and you probably have to help guide them to which strategy that you're gonna do. It's either the no test strategy or the testing strategy. The no test strategy says that they can release themselves from quarantine after 72 hours without a fever, which means they can't be taking medications like acetaminophen, ibuprofen, et cetera, one week after their symptoms started and they've got improvement in their symptoms. 
And I would always recommend that they consult with their PCP or another provider that is gonna follow them through this illness before they're released from quarantine. The testing strategy is the same as the new test strategy, but they also have to have two negative tests 24 hours apart. Again, where we're seeing the two tests uh, 24 hours apart is usually for healthcare providers or individuals that are gonna be in a patient facing situation or a high population um, type of setting, which can increase the risk to exposing others. If you're a PUI and you get a negative test, you can release after you get your negative test. Um, just uh, also what I would caution you on is if it is a negative test, but you're like 100% convinced that individual had um, COVID and they're falling into that 30% that may be getting a false negative test, those individuals, I will tell you, if they get worse, okay to retest. If they're not getting worse, but they're getting better, I would follow the no test strategy and tell them to quarantine like above 72 hours a febrile, one week after symptoms and they've started having improvements, I would tell them to make sure they quarantine until that time. And so that is kind of the basics of what we do with our PUI um, and some a little bit of background information. And so that should conclude our first, um, first of three lectures. And so we will go into the second and third here in a bit.